Prescribed fire and wildfire are nothing new to firefighters in the southeast. With almost a year-round fire season, fire has been a big part of the culture and land management practices for many years. In fact, when we look at prescribed burning, the southeast has by far the most active program, not including the state forestry departments or the military bases, which all have active RX programs, the U.S. Forest Service in Region 8 ignited almost 1,200 fires in 2005 and treated just under 1 million acres. In this module, we're going to first look at the various aspects of fighting fire in the southeast fuel models. Then we're going to reflect on the significant Golden Gate fire that took the life of a tractor plow operator in Naples, Florida. The Fish and Wildlife Service was the first agency to officially begin prescribed burning in the South as we know it back in the 1920s at St. Mark's Refuge. It's when we had the first documented prescribed burn when no other agencies were doing it. However, fire in the South is, dates back to prehistory. Um, in this area where we are right now, D'Aberville sailed along the coast in 1699 claiming this land for France and in his journals, he talked about seeing large smoke columns inland nearly every day. And uh, when he landed, he would see signs where Native Americans had set fires. And in fact, the first thing that, that he did when they decided to build their, their settlement was to set a fire to clear the vegetation. Fire suppression activities and prescribed fire activities, to me, go hand in hand. And we use every prescribed burn as a training ground for fire suppression. We don't have all the personnel at any one station in the southeast to do the burning that needs to be done, generally speaking. So we're constantly bringing in detailers from other refuges, other agencies. So it's important to me of somebody coming in here, uh, for whether it be a suppression or a severity detail or a prescribed fire, that, that they're willing to pick our brains and find out what's going on. Because when we have folks in, it's because we need help. And we do take a lot of folks for prescribed fire details to show them what we know about it, but to learn from them also. Because you can be fooled by the obvious out here. You can be out here every day working in the same environment year in, year out, and think you got it, and there's something out there that you're not seeing. You know, I also think that people can get knocked down when they're too big. Pride does come before a fall. And I think I've probably been in that situation. Well, for sure I've been in that situation thinking that I had the answers. And then, and then fire humbled me pretty quick, thinking I knew how to apply fire and I had, I had it down right. And uh, another good adage I'd tell you is that fire gives the test before the lesson. And that is so true. You think you know it, and then it'll give you a question you've never seen before, and you got to scramble to come up with the answer right then. A real common misconception that people bring to the southeastern United States from drier parts of the country has to do with the effect of relative humidity on fire behavior. And in the southeast, things will burn at humidities where things would not burn in other parts of the country. But for, for example, I mean, I've been on numerous fires where humidity is in the 80 to 90 percent range and we still have, you know, decent fire behavior. You can have a, if you've got a decent breeze pushing it, you can have a fast running fire with humidity in the 60s. You get humidities down into the 40s and things start getting you know, pretty dry. As a matter of fact, in most of the southeast, at least in uh, Florida, Alabama, and Georgia, red flag conditions come in at around 35 percent RH. If you're going to have below 35 percent for more than a couple of hours, you are in red flag conditions in the state of Florida. You know, 35 percent doesn't raise many hackles if you're in, you know, Nevada or, you know, West Texas or someplace like that. Heck, you know, that's a humid day. But in Florida, you get down into the mid-30s and things can get pretty dicey, especially if you've got any wind. If you get humidity down into the 20s, things are critical. If you get humidity in the teens, things are explosive. If you've got any kind of wind and you've got humidity in the teens in the southeastern United States, 
uh, especially if it's been any time since the last rain, you can have fire behavior that will astound you. So uh, things start getting dicey in the 30s, things start getting critical in the 20s, things start getting downright dangerous when you get down into the teens. This fire in South Florida, Florida in general, is a wind-driven phenomenon. The dispersion index is, a, is an indicator of the amount of stability or instability there is in the atmosphere. Obviously, the more unstable the atmosphere, there go the higher rating, 75 or above, the more unstable the atmosphere, the more erratic fire behavior you're going to have and the more aggressive fire behavior you're going to have. The fuels here in South Florida, um, it's job security. The fuels grow back so fast. Uh, we can do a burn in the Pinelands, fuel model 7. Um, and within two years, it's ready to burn again. Um, three years, we'll have really good fire behavior out there. Uh, much beyond that, at the four or five year age class, and things are so, um, burn so aggressively that we try and keep things down on the shorter end of the time scale just for ease of control. Um, a five year rough in fuel model seven can burn really hot, real intense. Um, fire behavior. So. The thing to me that's often missed about fire in the east, and I'm talking about from Maine all the way down here to the Everglades, is the level of complexity and the subtleties. One of the things I observed as a firefighter out west is, is that the principles that we were taught are very, very solid. Um, you can understand them very well. It's once we start getting into these environments, like the Everglades and a number of other specialized environments that are no less important, is that's where the subtleties, the nuances, if you will, really come out. And you must be an intense student of fire to pick up on those subtleties because they're the same principles. They just seem to be stretched and applied in very different ways. It's not unusual for us to get uh, crews, whether they come down to the prescribed fire training center or any amount of details that might get or on a wildland fire, and we see them bail out of their trucks um, with the slurry on their hard hats, uh, eight water bottles, the line packs, um, with an assumption that they're going to be using the Pulaski to dig fire line through an eight-foot palmetto. We usually have to have a little chat at that point that um, it's going to be a little different. The, probably the, the most valuable fire tool that we have here is the drip torch and the tractor plow. Uh, in some landscapes where the tractor plow is the most appropriate, that's our hotshot crew. That's our 20-man crew. Firefighters here have to use a lot of different specialties. They're more generalist than specialist. Uh, you wouldn't just be on a hand crew. You have to be able to do a little bit of everything. Um, the, the Western folks have an assumption that we don't see much fire, or our fire is somehow different in its physical process than their fire. Uh, that's always comical. It's not unusual for us to see uh, some of our Western colleagues lose their eyebrows to some of our so-called green fuels. Uh, because the flame links surprise them sometimes. On, on the other hand, the hard work ethic and the organization that the Western folks bring us is always impressive. It's always just almost invariably impressive to, to our firefighters and our fire management. And it does give us a, kind of raises the chin up bar for us in that way. All right, give you a little history here. This here on your right is a two-year-old rough. It's a southern, uh, southern rough, fuel model seven, and it's two years old. It looks green as a gourd, but let me tell you something, it does burn. The uh, southern fuels, uh, mainly in the seven fuel model range, has uh, got a lot of waxes and a lot of resins in it, that uh, even though when it does burn, it looks green right now, but uh, when they start putting a little heat to it, it's like somebody just threw gas to it. And it will actually get up and walk. 
We've had folks from out west, from California and everything coming here back in 89, 98, and 2000. And they're kind of looking at us saying, you know, this is Florida. What's going to burn here? This is all green. So I said, well, wait about a week and then tell me. Well, they were coming back to me saying, well, we need some new fire shirts and our line gear's got holes in it and all that kind of crap. So this green stuff does burn. Um, what we use for fire behavior, I use fuel model four just to get the intensities and the flame links on. Fuel model seven does not give it to me. Uh, it just, just doesn't have it. Uh, if you look at the fuel models, it's saying you got anywhere from three tons per acre. Uh, I've estimated we got about 30 tons per acre. So when the fire gets started down here, even though it is flat ground, everything is wind driven. But when the wind blows, this stuff will walk the dog. And it's putting up some impressive uh, fire behavior, spotting out a quarter to a half mile in front of it. Uh, the palm fronds here, the cabbage palms are probably the worst thing we've got. When fire gets up in it, it climbs right up in it because the boots have got a lot of uh, fine fuel in it from needle drape and everything else. And when it comes up in, it gets into the palm fronds, and then once they get up into the column, they can spot that quarter to a half mile out in front of you. You don't even notice it. Uh, the other fuel model we got is a fuel model three, which is uh, tall grass, a lot of muley grass and saw grass. And it just burns hot. It's fast and furious, but it doesn't uh, last long. Um, what we've got a lot of is the grass moving into the palmetto, which is the shorter stuff. Uh, then you look out through there, you start getting your ladder effect. It doesn't take long before you know it's in the crown. <clears throat> and that's, as far as hand line work, you don't do it. We use a lot of tractor plows, uh, swamp buggies like this. We get in behind the tractor plows, do a lot of burning out. But this stuff does, it's impressive. For flat ground, had a boy one time tell me from uh, California, he said, man, this stuff looks like, if you had some elevation, this is really crank. And I said, I'm glad we don't have any elevation. This stuff moves pretty good on flat ground. Humidities that we deal with down here in Florida, everybody thinks it's real high humidity. It is during the summertime when we get a lot of rain, 95 to 100% humidity every day, 95, 97% or 97 degrees, and it's sweltering down here. During the spring and fall, we can get down as low as 22, 24%. Our parameters, once it gets below 35 RH, uh, all prescribed burning will stop in South Florida anyway. Uh, at that time, we say it'll start burning holes in rocks because the humidity gets so low, it, you have problems with spotting and that kind of thing. The, um, we go by the Keach Byron Drought Index, KBDI. Once it reaches over 500 or 550 is our cutoff, um, we start having problems with it then, mainly with spotting. Uh, the intensities get more, the fire behavior starts picking up. Back in 98, it was up around 700 the whole summer. In 2000, 2001, it was doing the same thing. So um, a lot of our fires that are started down here are started by people. That's, we don't have, we got, Florida is the lightning capital of the world, but there's more people than there's lightning bolts, I think, because they, every one of them like to light the place up. Yep. Where I'm standing right now is a prescribed burn that we did nine days ago. And the primary objective of that was re reduce the fuel fuel loading. Second objective is to increase the habitat, which is now starting to re-sprout. As we can see here after nine days, it's already starting to re-sprout back up. The uh, parameters for the prescription were such that uh, we had winds less than 15. The 20 mile, 20 foot winds were at this time were 12 miles an hour. So through the stand here, we're figuring we're getting five to six mile an hour winds. And that's a real key to us if we're gonna try to protect any of the reproduction that's come in, some of our recruitment of our stand for pine reproduction. The, uh, as you can see, it pretty well knocked back the vegetation we have here. It didn't kill it, all it did is top killed it. We're going to re-sprout at the bottom, which is beneficial to the wildlife. <clears throat> the RH for the day when we burnt this was 52. It ran from 42 to 52. And uh, this is kind of a key idea for us is we want to get it below 35. We want to keep it above 35. You get your consumption rates, you get your one in 10 hour fuels consumed that you wanted, 75 to 95%, which we got. Um, we did control some of the understory species, which is a lot of this hog plum and uh, wax myrtle. 
we knock that back so it'll re-sprout. And then on the other side of the road here, we can kind of talk about, this is a three-year-old rough. With uh, anything below 35% humidity, you can kind of see what kind of vegetation you got. Got a pretty good lateral right into the crowns itself. So the hazards of that is uh, it's going to be running and spotting on you pretty quick. Flame intensity is going to be extreme. We were talking 25, 30 foot flame lengths. Possibly get into the crowns and start doing a crown fire. Even though it's not a continuous crown, it can take out the crowns. The other hazards in here is that you're walking through on vegetation, you can't see the ground. Now on the other side of the road, it was burnt, it's nice and clean. Versus this side, if you're trying to drag tools, trying to cut a line through this heavy vegetation and stuff, you're going to wear people out. With the amount of uh, humidity and the temperature we've had, that would kind of run folks down. I don't care how good a shape you're in, this stuff right here will work you to death. So we try to make sure that we use trails to do our fighting from, use our natural areas. There's a buggy trail that we're on right here is only about 12 feet wide, but it's far enough. The uh, BTUs cranked out by this stuff is unbelievable. It'll flat blister you. If you didn't have a suntan when you came to Florida, you'll have one after you leave this fire. It is extreme. Each geographical area in the country has its own set of safety hazards that are unique to their area. The Southeast is no exception. Let's listen to some good advice on what you should watch out for while working in this area. The most important thing, number one, I tell people in terms of critters is fire ants. Watch where you're standing. You don't want to get fire ants up your leg. They mass attack, they bite all at once, and the only way to stop an attack is to identify the bugler and kill it before it can blow the bugle and they all bite. Now nobody can do that, so if you do get bit, it's very dangerous. Some people can be allergic to the point of death and not know it till they get bit. And, it, it, and if you do get bit by fire ants, then you probably demobilize the rest of the day and hurts us. The second and very important item is how to walk through the woods if you're stringing fire. We have a lot of growth, a lot of vines, a lot of briars that'll reach out and grab you and can trip a person up if they don't know how to walk. So I stress not stepping over, but stepping on. Some folks um, actually carry hand clippers with them. If they reach, come up to a point of briar about a half inch or an inch in diameter, they just simply, simply snip it and keep going. My own technique is that I'll raise the drip torch so it quits dropping fuel and then turn and kind of back through the briar so it's against my pack and not tearing into my clothes until I get by it. And if I can't do that, I just back up and step on it. But that is the reason why we use aerial ignition so often is we don't like to put firefighters in those situations. But on small burns in certain areas, we can't use aerial ignition. We have to use that technique. Another important item in the safety briefing is traffic on the roadway. We live in an urban interface, we fight fire, we burn an urban interface. So a very, very serious threat to our safety is, are the motorists. And they're not watching the guys in the yellow shirts, they're watching the fire on the side of the road. And we have to watch out for them, be very careful on these public roads when we're using, burning up against them. Heat and humidity are also critical elements down here. There's a reason why we work slow down here. And it's not that we're lazy, it's because that's the environment we work in. And if you take your time and do it safely and slowly, you're going to get a lot more done in a day. Uh, been many folks, first day out, that they collapse from heat exhaustion, and we don't ever want it to go to heat stroke. You got to keep drinking water. I bring extra socks, extra t shirts, and change to stay cooler. And also, Another safety item, I'm sitting here sweating now, is that uh, getting your feet wet. People might come from drier climates and marvel at how we burn over standing water, or the fire line is flooded and yet we're getting spot fires and 25 foot flame lengths as we set fire. So bring extra socks, take care of your feet, bring foot powder, keep your feet dry, make sure your boots are oiled up. Um, everybody likes to wear whites or nicks, we all do, but down here the soils are low pH, 
three and a half to four on the average, and these boots weren't made for that. So you have to keep it greased up, snow seal, if you can say a brand name. Just something we all do, keep our boots greased up to protect our feet, because if we're walking all day, you gotta have good feet. The big things we caution about, number one is, um, number one is the weather. Um, it's a pretty flat land, everybody looks like it's a piece of cake to move around out here, but when the summer uh, temperatures are up, or even in the winter time when our temperatures are up, uh, the temperature indexes can get really high, and that really takes a toll on your body. So you really need to stay watered up, and you need to have a lot of water with you all the time. Um, the other thing that's a, a big thing that'll grab you out here is the lightning. And those the thunderstorms will build up, you know, just pretty unexpected. We try to monitor that kind of stuff, but uh, cells will build up here, and they'll be drop they'll be dropping rain five miles away from you, and you understand when you got a cell that's built up about you know, 40 to 60,000 feet over this system, you know, it can be rain and lightning out seven miles away from that cell, so that, that's a real hazard. Other than that, that uh, this land is pretty level, and you really can't see it right in here, but uh, Everglades here, South Florida, is underlined with limestone bedrock, which is exposed at the surface, which is really treacherous walking. It's, it's, uh, I always characterize it as lava beds with no slope and grass growing out of it. <laughs> That's a good way for a Westerner to kind of look at the pinnacle rock that we have down in here. And then besides that, we've got the, a whole host of things that'll reach out and grab you. Uh, we've got four kinds of venomous snakes down here in South Florida, including the Eastern Diamondback Rattlesnake. And most of those animals will stay away from you if they can, but when your firefighter's out there, you always gotta watch where you're stepping over and stepping to, watching where you're putting your hands because those kind of creatures will be out there ready to grab you. And then uh, the number one injury that we have to firefighters in Everglades National Park statistically is exposure, exposure to a uh, Florida poisonwood tree, which is, uh, it's the same family as poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac. Um, uh, it grows to a, it's a bush that'll grow up to about 35 feet tall. And it's really prevalent out here, not only in these hammock habitats, but in the pinelands and any place that hasn't had a lot of fire on it in the last few years. Uh, in Florida in particular, sea breeze is a huge factor. Not only the breeze itself, but how that sea breeze front affects the, the air mass that's in place. You'll get an area right along that sea breeze front where you have very, very high dispersion. Right at that convergence of that sea breeze front, you can have some very erratic fire behavior. If you're in the area, you need to know the conditions that a sea breeze that starts kicking in, when it's likely to uh, come into play, you know, both the you know, dependent on cloud cover, dependent on air temperature, dependent on water temperature, dependent on the, the prevalent breezes at the time, you know, your larger air mass that's taking effect. And whether you're on a wildfire or prescribed fire, you've got to be cognizant of the sea breeze almost anywhere in Florida. Even in the uh, Florida Peninsula, you can have sea breezes that'll push all the way to the interior, sometimes even across almost to the other side where the two sea breezes from each side will converge and cause thunderstorm activity, erratic winds, fire whirls, things along those lines. First thing foremost is uh, make sure you get a map. Find out who's in charge. Second thing is we try to use the black as much as we possibly can. There's some good areas here. Once the grass burns off, there are escape routes into that. We stress every time when we do a burn or doing a wildfire, our safety lines are the plow lines. We try to make them at least two blades wide. Uh, the cypress domes itself, if they're wet, those are real good spots to go to. Usually cypress does not burn uh, just because there's nothing there for it to burn. So those are probably one of the areas. Communications is probably one of the biggest ones we try. A lot of the areas we have out here, whether it be in the urban interface or out here in the wildland itself, uh, everybody needs to have communication. And we make sure that if you do not have communication when you get here, make sure you hook up with somebody or you get one. We make sure we have enough radios on hand so everybody's got one. Well, when we dive into LCES from the get-go, uh, we have something that's gonna be inherently different. Because of our topography and the density of our fuels often, uh, the question I ask folks is, where are you gonna post your lookout? And a lookout uh, serves a very, very different or it has to take very, very different tactics here. Uh, it's not like you can crawl up on a ridge and look down on your crew. So things from the top of a Type 6 engine or a hose reel to being extremely mobile 
uh, on an ATV or on foot is the way that you mitigate lookouts. So that, that from the get-go, to be able to see your crew, know your crew, and know fire and fire behavior is going to take a very different uh, strategy than what folks are used to. The other, in terms of fire order, I, I think that, well, I like the one, and this is one of the things that I encourage all people to pay attention to here, is to initiate all your actions based on current expected fire weather and fire behavior because that's really going to dictate what you do, being heads up and asking a lot of questions about what do these fuels do when the RH gets to blank? Uh, should I be concerned when I have a probability of ignition of 40%? Those kind of things, uh, again, they're fundamental basic fire behavior things and they're questions we always should ask when we get on a new piece of ground. But here, the, the fire shows itself so rapidly here and changes in fire behavior that it requires you to, again, have a really much higher elevated situ uh, situational awareness. And again, if you initiate your own action, your actions on fire weather, fire behavior, I think you're still going to be safe.